All right, I hope I can find my way through this. Um, my name's uh, David Jenny. I also go by Dave or Grandpa. Uh, the latter is usually in the form of an accusatory question, such as, uh, Grandpa, don't you know the names of all the D Disney fairy princesses? So, um, but uh, uh, we're just going to uh, look at some waterways and water bodies. And it should come as no surprise to anyone here that these things change through time. And some of those changes can be catastrophic, and others might be slow and natural. So we'll take a look at a few examples of those. And then how can we map these in open historical map and perhaps discern the causes of some of these events and the impact of them as well. So, um, all right, basically open historical map is open street map. They're pretty much the same. Uh, it's the same user interface. The big difference is that OSM it does not have the, well, it does in some cases, but open historical map has a start date and an end date if the item is no longer around. And uh, this is just, uh, uh, with those two tags, you can do quite a bit, including animations such as this one. Um, and you can see that there's railroads coming along, being built through time, that uh, waterways are, are pretty constant in this picture and that uh, highways are coming along. There's some buildings that are being built. So you can do some pretty impressive things with open historical map. Um, this one, however, has some problems. Uh, when you realize that you're looking at a map of the central portion of the second most populous city in the state of Colorado, you wonder, where's the buildings? Where are the streets? Um, other features are missing, too. Um, so that's kind of reflects the state of open historical map, as Min mentioned earlier. <laughs> you know, it's largely a blank slate. It's up to us to continue to add to this and improve the quality of it. But uh, so far, com that's coming along pretty nicely. Um, and I don't know why this is not moving to the next slide, but uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, she a little slow here, huh? or fast. There we go. Um, we're going to go to the, of course, the theme of this conference is the great outdoors. And uh, one place to visit that great outdoors is a state park that's halfway between Denver and Colorado Springs. And that's called Castlewood Canyon State Park. Um, it's a great place if you have a family. Uh, there's moderate hiking available there. Um, it's, it's got some trails. It's got scenery. It's a great place for studying nature and history as well. So uh, I'm going to take a look at some of the changes there. Um, it's, it's been very nicely mapped in OpenStreetMap. So just about all, all the trails there, as well as some of the other amenities. Um, and the basic canyon itself is formed from Cherry Creek, which flows north from this area into, the, uh, into Denver, and there it joins the South Platte River. Um, the, the top part of the canyon, or the rim of the canyon, is formed of a rock formation known as the Castle Rock Conglomerate. It's very hard and very tough, and the Cherry Creek has cut down into that into a much softer layer below that called the Dawson Arcos. Uh, that becomes important and part of the story a little later, but uh, no, this is not going to be a, a, I'm not going to give a geology quiz at the end of this. So. Don't worry about the details too much. Um, uh, one of the highlights of uh, your, your journey through Castlewood Canyon is the old dam. And that dam was constructed in 1890. It burst in 1933. And 
and uh, that's kind of the picture of what's left of it there now. Um, the, uh, okay. And part of that story, or part of the history in the area, also includes the Lucas Homestead. So they built this, uh, or they built this concrete house in 1898 and farmed the area and took advantage of the dam and the water supply resulting from that. Um, and then we can kind of see, this is kind of a large map of the, the whole area, some of the features around there. The town of Castle Rock's about five miles to the west. The lake behind Castlewood Dam is shown there in the center. It looks pretty small in this picture. It's probably about a half wide, half mile wide at its widest point there. Um, there's also some railways, two of which are still there. The Colorado and Southern got washed away in a different flood in 1937 and was not rebuilt. Um, and this is probably a more detailed, closer look at it. Um, the Lucas Homestead up to the north. It's about a mile and a half north of the dam site. And there's a picture of Castlewood Dam, which was built in, nine, oh, the picture was taken in 1900. Behind Castlewood Dam is Lake Louisa. And Lake Louisa got its name after a local rancher who cooked hot meals for the dam construction crew. So, um, and you can see from this picture that the dam is starting to leak. That, uh, and despite that, the engineer reassured everybody that the dam was safe, in no danger of collapsing. Uh, so no, nobody worried about it after that. Until 1933. And in 1933, that, 1933, I, I, I think it was kind of a break in the Dust Bowl era. Um, in any case, there were numerous rainstorms that hit the area at the time. Uh, and then on the night of August 3rd, or the morning of August 3rd, the dam started overflowing. The caretaker tried to relieve the pressure. He was unsuccessful at that. He tried to drive out, but the road had been washed away at that point. Uh, cell phone service was probably not quite as good in 1933 as it is today. So he ended up walking to Castle Rock, which is about five, six miles away. And there notified uh, Parker telephone operator, N Nettie Driscoll, that a flood was uh, on its way. Driscoll called ahead to Denver, and they were able to evacuate lower downtown Denver in the Cherry Creek area at that time. So that saved a lot of lives. However, it did cause quite a bit of damage in the city of Denver. So, so that's kind of the story of the dam collapse as far as history goes. Um, the cause, well, again, we're dealing with three different geologic eras, er, uh, three different geologic layers here, starting with the Dawson Arcos. That's the oldest, going back to 55 million years. That was followed 37 million years by a volcanic eruption. This is my mid-journey depiction of what that volcanic <laughs> eruption might have looked like. And then uh, the, the resulting tuff layer um, was eroded, largely eroded, and washed away when a heavy rains hit about 37 million years ago. So um, and that formed the Castle Rock conglomerate. It's a very hard rock. Um, and the dam itself is made out of that hard rock. Um, it's got some very large, well, some smaller, but also some very large boulders, these gray boulders, like up here um, in the top picture, are, are pieces of that volcanic tuff to, were eroded and fell into the streams and then got solidified into that conglomerate. Uh, below it, the Dawson Arcos is very soft, and unfortunately, it underlies the dam. Um, you can see in the picture here, we're holding, when we started taking that picture, that was one pebble or one uh, piece of rock, and it broke just holding it. So it's very soft, and especially when it gets wet. So that's probably what led to the dam collapse. Um, we can show this. Uh, 
series of events here. And uh, we've got the, uh, I don't know why this thing is. Uh, I'm not used to these touch pads. I'd prefer a, uh, there we go. Okay, there's, there's the lake after the dam was constructed in 1890. And uh, I believe we're, I don't know, is this thing moving or? There we go, okay, now I got it. All right. All right, and there the dam, there the lake goes away, the dam collapses. Um, that area is the state park that was formed around the dam. There's also some new highways coming in too, so that's kind of the picture. <laughs> the, the, the state park also included the Lucas Homestead, so. But, uh, There, I don't know. It's, I guess. Um, in any case, the okay. Thank you. The um, Castlewood Canyon is still still undergoing some uh, changes. There were big floods again in 2023, which wiped out some of the trail structure and some of the bridges. There was a new build, new bridge that was built this year, and you can see that in the background and. Uh, as a result of that, then these vi visitors that you see in the picture on the right uh, shouldn't have to do this uh, very grueling stream crossing that you see here. <laughs> Knowing them, they'll probably continue to do the stream crossing even after the bridge was constructed. There's another area up, up in Wyoming, the La Prelle Creek. I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's near Douglas, Wyoming, and it flows into the North Platte River. And there, there was a dam also built across that in 1909. Um, and then uh, um, in downstream from that dam is a natural bridge. It's called Ayers Natural Bridge. It's named for a family that donated the bridge and the surrounding few acres to Converse County, where a park now sits. But let me try another animation there. And you can see the dam, or the water behind the dam. The green area to the north of the lake is the natural bridge. Now all of a sudden that, that lake level <laughs> went down quite a bit. Uh, so what happened there? Uh, basically, it's a preventive measure. They're trying to prevent a catastrophe because that dam was built in 1909. It was given an estimated lifespan of about 50 years, and here we are 115 years later. So the water level has been lowered as a safety measure to prevent the collapse of the dam and the similar. So, so all these things have been uh, depicted in uh, open historical map too. So um, we're, one more quick thing here. This is a town of Elk Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, a very small town. It's got some history to it. It's near a scenic area also. Uh, the Medicine Bow Mountains are just to the south of it. Um, and then the, this is a map that's uh, underneath it you can see the USGS topographic map from it's dated 1955 um, and it's 1982 overlay. And you can probably also pick out the waterway there. That's the Medicine Bow River, and I'm referring to the light blue that is on the topo map underneath it. And you can see that's running through some houses. So either there's a problem with the map or some of the local residents have a very wet basement year round. So um, the darker blue line is the, the stream or river as it is uh, depicted in open street map. And that is a much more recent, it's from the more recent imagery rather than the map itself. Uh, if you look at the t Google Maps, for example, they're following the topo map there. So, um, so it looks like the stream has changed course. OSM has it correct. <laughs> the USGS is still 
still hasn't caught up, and uh, NHD, the National Hydrologic uh, data set, reflects the older USG, USGS topo map, and it's the same as it, it was in 1955. So, um, so the the idea is that dates um, that you think a data set has may not be exactly right. So be careful when. Loading map, loading data into Open Historical Map or Open Street Map for that matter. So that's about all I have. Um, this is kind of sums it up here, I guess. It's a quote from the wiki page on the Open Historical Map, and uh, and there's various sources. If you just Google or Duck Duck Go whatever area you're interested, you could probably find some pretty good sources. Uh, we do like you to sort of cite the sources in Open Historical Map uh, and respect copyrights as well, but other than that, there's a lot of data that you can certainly add. Um, anyways, that's all I have. I don't know if we have any time for questions. Or Thank you very much. Yes, we certainly have time for questions. It's a great reminder that everything, most natural features that we map are a result of, of geological, geomorphological, or, or man-made processes. So uh, thank you for that. Any questions for him? Yes. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, it's less of a question and kind of more of a comment that I'm interested in. I'm thinking about modern day seasonal rivers and seasonal flooding. I was talking to someone who lives in Bangladesh and he was talking about how there's seasonal settlements kind of dependent on those rivers. So have you guys looked into like, because you know, you're thinking like like the pat, like, like historical event, but these seasonal events become historical quickly. And then I just want to confirm, open historical map is completely separate from open street map, right? Like it's two, but is there any sort of way to connect them somehow? Uh, well, <laughs> the second question first, yeah. they. The, the infrastructure is pretty much the same in terms of it's a very familiar interface. You can use JASM with Open Historical Map or the ID editor, so, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, they are two separate databases. There are licensing issues in terms of importing data from Open Street Map into Open Historical Map. So, and, uh, um, so it, it's probably safest not to do that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and then the, in terms of seasonal structures or seasonal changes, yes, that can be an issue, especially when you're trying to map these things, you know, you don't, because there's so much variation in stream levels, um, at, uh, in a, that uh, it makes a problem for mapping, and they change through broader time periods to decades, uh, centuries, whatever, so. I, I I don't I I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's uh, kind of my take on it. <laughs> Any other questions? So, what are you mapping next, Dave? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got some other volunteer jobs besides OHM, so, so I'm probably going to go ahead. <laughs> go. <laughs> Wrong answer, I know. Um, I'm, I'm also working on highways, um, and uh, there, there's some big, big discussions. On, oh, OHM has a forum that's a great place for going back and forth on issues, and you know we're kind of in our infancy in that respect. So, so we're trying to resolve a lot of these issues collectively and come up with a consensus on how to do things. But uh, you know, there's a lot of roads and that need to be added, railroads. Although what's out there is really nice, but. Uh, things along those lines. Jeff has done a great job of adding county boundaries and state lines and so on. So, so we're probably, uh, you know, we're, we're coming along. <laughs> Thank you so much for the great presentation, Dave. Thank you.